Welcome back to Derek Lambert's channel, Big D. Ladies and gentlemen, people are dying from an epidemic called addiction, drug addiction. And today we're going to talk to a doctor about Suboxone. We're going to talk about some deep pertinent things related to the topic. We're tearing down the stigma. We want to save lives. That's all we're about. So here we are trying to delve in. Dr. Fareed Bonimod will be going into this topic with us and he'll be discussing details about Suboxone you usually don't hear anywhere else, as well as he is from the American Addiction Institute, Mind and Medicine. Be sure to check him out in the description. He's got a YouTube channel. Go like, subscribe, listen to this content, be open-minded. That's one of the things they teach us when we enter into these type of topics. That's what I'm doing. I love you guys. Thank you for joining me, Dr. Fareed Bonimod. And uh, I'm going to jump right into these questions, So, but I, I, I want to thank you for joining me here. Thank you, Derek. Uh, let me just say it's an honor to be on your channel. I'm kind of new to this stuff and figuring stuff out, but I've looked at what you're doing. I think what you're doing is awesome, supporting this community, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, can, I hope I can lend something to that and we can do some stuff in the future. So thank you for having me on. Absolutely, um, and you're the you're the expert in this field. You're an MD uh, doctor, and and I want to ask you some questions if you don't mind. We're going to jump right into a touchy one. Uh, a lot of people want to know more about, and that's buprenorphine, which is more of the technical term, or as known as Suboxone. Is it addictive? And and is that a bad thing or a good thing? I guess so. Can you touch on that somewhat? I get this question all the time, and I I, I want to give a lengthy answer. So cut me off. Every single day I deal with this question and here's why, let me give you a general answer and get into the particular. Why is this even a question? And so I'll get a guy into the clinic or the IOP and I suggest medication assisted treatment with buprenorphine and they're like, no, I don't want to substitute one addiction for another. This is the way the question is often couched and it blows me away uh, when that question is asked, you know, you're 28 years old, you're homeless, you've been to 30 treatment centers, you failed 30 times, you have hepatitis C, you have HIV, you've been on the streets, you've been in jail, you don't have a job, you've lost everything, okay? And let me tell you what buprenorphine is, my friend, to, to the patient. Okay, uh, you're talking about substituting one addiction for another. First, let me tell you, my friend, if you went to any other civilized, progressive nation in the world that treats treatment, this question wouldn't even be asked because they would look at you like you're insane. It's only in the United States because we're couched in such backwards thinking in our approach where a lot of it is from the, you know, and, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but it's true, whether it's our public policy, our Judeo-Christian background, our perception of marketing, there's a lot of reasons, but the question is a little bit of insanity. What is addiction? Okay, it is a substance that I continue to use. I have more need for, and I'm putting this in simple terms. I have more need for all the time. I constantly increase my dosing. Okay, and then from a psychosocial perspective, all of my being is geared towards gaining that substance. So let me put it to you in practical terms, my friend. You are addicted to heroin. All right, what does that get you? Overdose, pulmonary edema, endocarditis, soft tissue infections, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, contact visits to the emergency department. Let's go to the psychological and social. You lose your friends, you lose your family, you go into the jail system, your credit score is probably 300. You end up selling yourself on the street. I can continue to go on. That's what we call addiction. Okay, I'm gonna put you on Suboxone, start treatment my way, what are you gonna get? No hep C, no hep B, no soft tissue infection, no endocarditis, no pulmonary edema, you'll get off the street, you'll get a home, you get your life back, it's gonna take some time, your neurons build from your frontal cortex to your midbrain, and you'll go on to live like a regular person. I guess you're addicted to Suboxone, and I guess that guy's addicted to insulin, and I'm addicted to my cane, and the other guy's addicted to his heart failure medication, and the other guy's addicted to asthma. Please understand your perception of this is wrong. Now, am I saying that nobody could do it without Suboxone? No, I'm telling you what's called metadata 
and statistical probability from populations, and there's a bell curve to all of this, and every patient should be educated about buprenorphine, offered it, and then given extensive education and psychosocial support so they lose all of the stigma and the guilt and the traditional approaches to addiction. Does that help? I'm gonna stop myself because I can go on. Absolutely, you make me wanna ask another question that's very important here because you know, it is far better. It's a far better of the lesser two when it comes to the evils, if you were to consider it even that. And the only negative thing I have seen in my own experience was headaches and uh, and maybe a little nausea here and there. But when I came to get off of it, I never tapered properly. And so I want to talk about tapering because people are like, Suboxone's only used for two weeks and you're supposed to get in it and off of it and rehabs use it to, you know, get people off. What do you think about this? Like long period taper? Do you, how do you know how long someone should be on something like that? And and I've seen people's lives improve from this and I've seen also people abuse this stuff because they weren't really committed to try and be successful with recovery. What do you think when it comes to this uh, taper that you've seen successful? You ask such great questions and they're so multi-layered and I deal with these kinds of questions every day. And like I said, every single piece I can give a two hour lecture on. I'm gonna try and uh, dissect it and give short answers. Please ask me if something's not clear. I'm trying to be quick here. Uh, and I know your time is uh, valuable here. Number one, when you, you said one thing to me, hey, I've seen this stuff used in detoxes and rehabs for two weeks. It is categorically absolutely not supposed to be used to, as a medication to get someone off for one week or two weeks. In fact, you have a higher chance of relapse if it's done that way. In fact, it's not indicated for that. Now, SAMHSA and the ruling bodies have kind of let that go because public perception and pressure is so strong and so much nonsense gets into the view of the public and the rehab industry, not the academic world, the industry uh, needs to get paid. And so you got, they, they've been pushing this 12 step thing or, or abstinence thing for so long and the insurance companies are dishing out millions and people are going to 40 rehabs. So now everyone says, we offer Suboxone. Okay, you're not supposed to take, put someone on Suboxone and taper them off in 12 days. That is not what addiction is. Addiction is a chronic disease with long-term recovery and you aim for remission and Suboxone type products were never meant for this quick rehab thing. You increase the chance of relapse, overdose, and death. That's that. Okay, the data is clear on this. Okay, now uh, getting some, I, I forgot the rest of your question. I think the other thing is getting someone on it when you get off of it. I, I, that's the question, right? The, the other part of the Tapering, do you think that they should taper over a long period of time? Great, great, a wonderful question. Uh, and this, uh, this is a great question. The data is clear that putting someone on this stuff pound for pound saves a lot of lives. One thing we don't have what's called in statistics validated data. Validated data means I can look at it and be certain about time, place, thing, action. There is no good validated data on when to get you off of it. What there is is clinical experience and, and just basic clinical gestalt. This is, a, this is a maintenance medication, which means it implies long term. What does that mean? Okay, we don't have the data. Here's what it means for me. When you come into wherever, my clinic, my office, and you ask that question, I tell you, I don't know when you're gonna get off of it. But should you really worry about that question? Today, you have hepatitis C, HIV, you're homeless, you got uh, track marks all over your body, you got two felonies, you got a warrant for your arrest, you're, you're doing unspeakable things in the street to survive. Why don't you worry about the first step? Let's get you to that place. And then let me give you an example, kid. You are sitting in front of me and let's say, for example, I had to keep you on this for the rest of your life. As a physician, I look at every action I take and I look at the risk versus the benefit. I'm going to put you on Suboxone. You're going to be on this, God willing, for 100 years. What's the benefit? What's the harm? Well, the harm 
is you have to take this medication. Okay, the diabetic has to take his medication. You might have some constipation. I can treat that easily. Okay, you might have some, uh, 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 you know, testosterone issues in the long run, but that's very simple to treat. What are the uh, benefits? Okay, no hep C, no HIV. Your credit score will come up. You'll have a life. You'll get to engage with your family, friends, and so forth. So in theory, if I had to keep you on this forever, I'm okay with it because the risk-benefit analysis from a mathematical perspective tells me that me as a physician, I'm going to give you a hell of a lot more than take away from you if I was giving you chemotherapy for a year and I'd kill you. So that's that part. And, uh, uh, and so uh, when do I get someone off it? I'll touch on that really quick. Here's how I know when you can come off of it. When you're showing up to your medical office, when you are on time, when you're paying for your bills, when you're uh, uh, taking care of your family, when you come in here and we bullshit about anything but your substance abuse, you don't even think about shooting up, that tells me your frontal cortex no longer has a connection, now has a connection with your midbrain, and we can, if you like, talk about tapering, and that should be done in a very controlled setting, which is talking to me weekly. I manage the taper. It's sliced differently for every patient. You are not under the threat of me cutting you off. I will do what I have to do and adjust the dose as long as you have every one of those other things. You're not thinking about dope. You're not doing dope. You're not getting hep C, HIV, homelessness, losing your family, horrend. You see what I'm saying? So at a clinical level, I will try to keep very close contact even when the time, if the time for the taper comes. But I honestly tell everybody, I do not have the validated scientific data of when there's a time to taper, one year, six months, three months. And everybody should be taken care of the same way, which leads me to, a, I'll make a quick comment. We have moved into the, to a society of algorithms and metadata. A human being, to be a doctor and doctoring is dealing with a human being and it's dealing with every issue with respect and autonomy for that person's decisions and then enabling them with education and tailoring the care for each one of them. We don't have that anymore. Things move so fastly, you're just another soup, Campbell soup on a factory line. Okay, time to taper. Okay, time to put you on this. And you see this at all levels of medicine. And I try not to do that with this very sensitive, complex disease. Th does that help? Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with everything you said. Another question, can you overdose from Suboxone? H have you ever seen a case like that or ever heard of one? Fantastic question, and while I answer that, I'll also answer the benzo question because they talk about benzos and opiates together will make you overdose. So here's the thing. The way Suboxone works, uh, if I had a graph, which I don't, uh, there's a linear line that goes up this way if I was taking straight opiates. The more I take, the more effect I have, right? The more effect I have, and eventually the final effect is overdose, respiratory arrest, okay? Suboxone doesn't go this way, it goes like this and it levels off at a certain level where it no longer has an impact on you in terms of symptoms and response. What that means is the saturators, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the receptors get saturated, okay? And so can you overdose on Suboxone? I think it would take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of strips. I'm not saying this as a clinical advice. I'm just telling you it's almost impossible because at 32 milligrams, theoretically, the receptors are completely saturated. Okay, so you can for it's very, uh, you know, for medical legal reasons, I'm going to say it's very difficult to overdose it. I'm not advising someone to take 100 of them because it should have no effect on you. That being said, this brings on a lot, another uh, controversial issue. People go into uh, a pharmacy or doctor's office and the 
pharmacist, uh, they call me, they're like, oh, this person's on Suboxone. Are you sure you want to put them on a small dose of benzos or whatever I'm doing? And most guys don't add benzos. Well, let me tell you, most addicts have severe anxiety issues that needs to be addressed and separated at some point, but there might be a short period of time, long period of time, they need to be on benzos. Again, I approach benzos in the same way as Suboxone, close monitoring, minimal scripts, and psychosocial intervention. But when you add, let's say, 0.5 of clonopin to 24 milligrams of Suboxone, I'm not decreasing your respiratory rate. That's insanity. I'm not increasing your chance of overdose. The data that shows is that when you have overdose deaths, they often have benzos on board. And so there's this idea that benzos help decrease your respiratory rate and arrest. And some of the literature shows that with all of its limitations, including buprenorphine, but it's you gotta tease that out and have a little bit of courage of your convictions if you understand the data that you're reading. It's okay for me to have Joe on one milligram of clonopin a day plus 24 milligrams of Suboxone on top of the fact that I follow them weekly and then I'll address the clonopin because for me that's that's super toxic in the long run and that's a whole separate lecture. But no, it's for the most part really difficult to overdose on this stuff and and uh, it takes quite a bit to, uh, you know, uh, theoretically at the pharmacological level and physiological level, this stuff saturates your receptors. How are you going to overdose? Yeah, Dr. B, I got I got one more because <clears throat> we're, we're strapped for time here and I, I have to follow up with another interview. We're going to we're going to have to do a series and talk about a variety of different uh, uh, substances that maybe we can discuss and addiction and this is your field of expertise so um, for those of you who are watching this make sure you guys get down in the, in the comments and, and ask questions and uh, give us some thoughts of what you'd like to see because I love what he's saying so far last question I know people and this is from experience who took their suboxone strip melted it down into liquid and they inject it or they break it up, they put it in a toothpaste cap, add water, they let it dissolve and they sniff it. Now, I don't know if it's all psychological and it's just part of the ritual of the habit they had on the street so they're just trying to keep using the same habit whether it be injecting or sniffing or is there really any, are they getting anything extra from that or is it doing the same thing? And also, and also can, I'm sorry, one more on that is that when they're injecting it, is there a higher risk of something really going wrong in terms of how the drug is affecting the body versus them taking it by tongue or sniffing it? Your questions are so wonderful. Uh, I have a lot of clinical experience with all of it, and I have a lot to say out of all of it. And again, I'll try to uh, keep it short. Let me answer the first part. Well, let me try and answer it all. It is such a complex disease in terms of physiology and psychological behavior, and that's what prompts the person to do those kinds of things. Uh, and I have a guy that smokes it, and he kept coming into my office and telling me, I smoke it, it's disgusting, right? You're taking a, and, and you know, I worked with him for about a year and a half, and now we finally got him to stop smoking it. He has a baby, he has a job, he has a family, let me tell you about that. Uh, so, God, there's so much uh, you put in there. I really would like to break it down and answer each part, and hopefully we can do it in the future. So uh, let me real quick. Do you get a high or a rush? Sure, they can get a little high and a rush, but it's meaningless, and it's not very dangerous except uh, you know, the foolishness of taking a strip of paper and injecting it in your system. Uh, that can cause you harm. But that being said, it's pretty difficult to overdose on it or get any kind of meaningful rush on it, okay? Uh, now, it's on the street, and some people may use it that way, and some of my patients might use it that way. You know what my response is? I try to keep up uh, and be careful of that. I try to look for diversion and selling, but in general, if you were in Africa and the U.S. cut off some years back malaria drugs for those people because we weren't making any money off of it, and you create a black market for malaria drugs, and all these guys are buying and trading and selling this crap, and a lot of people are using it incorrectly, I still wouldn't care. You know why? Pound for pound, lives are being saved. Okay? 
that needs to be addressed and we need to deal with it. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm okay with that kind of harm given the benefit of this stuff getting out there. So that's that part. Can, it, uh, can you get a high? Yes, you can get a little high. I'm even okay with that. I try to stop people doing that and, and get them to reconnect the frontal cortex to the midbrain. But, it, 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 and people do that and it shows you how difficult and complex this disease is and that's why, you know, I always say, you know, a prescription monkey can write you a script and give it out to you. I'm a doctor. I keep tabs of you very closely. Let's get you to a place where you take this stuff correctly and you take it in the right way. And uh, the other part of your question, God, what was that? There's so much I'm trying to cover. You, the first part of your question was? The first part of my question was just simply discussing the methods in which they take it other than the way prescribed. And the second and last part was, the, can it like, can it harm them if you inject it? Like, is it deathly or is it kind of going to the same place in the brain and it, and it does somewhat the same thing except a quicker rush? Yeah, it's not particularly deadly. Uh, except like you're in, you shouldn't be injecting stuff in your body. I've had people smoke it, sniff it, inject it. I had one guy that used to like to put it in a syringe without a needle and put it up his butt because he had read correctly that there's a rich plexus of venous system in your butt. So he thought it could get in his system quicker. So he would just shove it up his butt in, a, in some liquid and hope he gets a high. He wasn't getting a high, I can assure you that. So people do get a little bit of a rush probably. Uh, but it's not worth it, and it's the complexity of the disease. Is it deadly? I'm not going to say someone can't die from it. That would be irresponsible of me, but certainly you shouldn't be injecting anything in your body or sniffing anything that's not supposed to be sniffed. That being the case, if you go through the pharmacological mechanics, it's not particularly deadly or, or dangerous, but don't do it, and I'm not advising you to do it. And uh, so that's that part. And why they do it, it shows you how difficult this disease is. It, Dr. B, this is so good. Um, I'm learning so much from you. I really am. I, this is, I've learned a lot so far just in these four questions. We have to continue. Um, th thank you for joining me. Let's do this again. It was absolutely my pleasure. Uh, I'm here to support you in any way I can. That was a lot of fun. It gives me an opportunity to answer these questions. And please feel free. Ask me difficult questions. If you don't agree with something or if you see it, give me an opportunity, if there is something, to stand up and be able to explain myself. Uh, there's a saying with philosophers. They say, if you can't put it into words, you do not have a thought. And so if I can't respond to you, then I'm wrong. Uh, uh, so always remember that I'm, I'm open for anything and it was an absolute pleasure. I, again, I thank you for having me on your channel. I think what you're doing is great. And yes, let's continue this anytime you like. Hey, I hope you guys liked that interview. We've got a lot more coming. Check him out on his YouTube channel down in the description. And we will be carrying on this topic with buphenorphine or AKA known as Suboxone.